Hello, and welcome to The Scriptures Are Real. Uh, this is a little bit of a different beginning because we're going to jump into the real beginning of this second week. And for those of you who listened to last week's episode, you'll already know that I was going to do this. Uh, we took the beginning of this episode where Dr. Dan Belknap and I reviewed, especially he reviewed the first several chapters of Romans, and we stuck it on to the overview of Romans that I did for last week. But the reason Dr. Belknap was doing that was because we won't understand what's going on starting in chapter 7 if we don't understand everything he was saying about the first part. So if you haven't listened to that first part, I highly, highly recommend that you go back and listen to that first part. And uh, if I were you, uh, I would review it, even if you did listen to it, before you listen to the rest of this podcast, I would review uh, all of the things that Dr. Belknap went through, because it leads right into what we're going to talk about this week and what I think is a really fun episode. So with all of that being said, here comes the normal introduction and the rest of the podcast for this week. This is the podcast where we talk about elements of the scriptures that have made them become real to us because we believe that helps us draw more power out of them and we need all the help we can get. I'm your host, Kerry Mielstein, and I have with me just a fantastic guest I'm so excited to have with us. His name is Dr. Daniel Belknap, and uh, you'll hear from him a few other times uh, during the rest of the year. So we'll have you know different phases of the introduction of Dr. Belknap, I guess. Dr. Belknap is from Sandy, Utah. Uh, did his undergrad and master's at BYU, uh, did his PhD in Northwest Semitics, which is the languages that are like Hebrew and Hebrew related uh, in uh, at the University of Chicago, uh, has a wonderful family and uh, is just a, a wonderful guy. And you'll hear has a wonderful way of thinking. So welcome, Dan. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. being here. So having set this up, we we now have um, a, a newness. We're we're reborn. We're reborn. But with that said, we still have a bit of a problem. Chapter seven for me, by the way, is one of the more difficult chapters to read through. It's just he talks about law, but then he talks about the body. It, it's just hard. So I'm going to try to explain part of what he says. So know ye not? This is verse one. Know ye not, brethren? For I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Right. So now mm -hmm. it's this law. Is it the law of Moses? It seems to be, even though he doesn't mention it, and verse two seems to be talking about divorce, right? There's certainly legalities to divorce in the law of Moses. Right. Right. And and especially that clue, I speak to them that know the law seems to be a yeah, I'm talking about the law of Moses here. But. Right, right. But it's got to be a stand-in to this larger argument that he seems to be making. Yes. So verse four, wherefore, my brethren, ye are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So in this case, pointing out that the law of Moses was inadequate to save you, that the relationships even established in the law of Moses were inadequate. We now have a new relationship with Christ. Just as he's talked about birth, now he talks about marriage, right? Right. So and, and maybe I can even insert here, I, I think he is, this is one of the clues he's talking specifically about the law of Moses and in, in what he does in two and three. I think this is his argument that they don't need to worry about the law of Moses anymore because he's saying, look, if a woman is if through marriage, she's bound to her husband. And as long as he's dead, if she's with another man, or I mean, as long as he's alive and she's with, then she's with another man, she's adulterating. Right. Right. But if, if her husband dies, then she can be married to someone else. It's not adultery. And then he's in essence saying that's what's happened with the law. The law of Moses is over, so we're not beholden to it. So we are free to do this a different way. Yeah. And and I would think I think it even develops off of uh, chapter six with it died. You died. The old man yeah. died. Right? The old man died. The old the law old man died. died. Everything died. The old right? covenant died, however you want to say it. Exactly. It with the if you got baptized. This died. That's the symbolism here. You right. died. The old man died. You're new, right? And this mm -hmm. can allow you to have a new relationship with God. In this case, he's going to describe it as a marriage one, right? In right. the next chapter, he's going to talk about it in terms of children. In the in the next chapter after that, he's going to talk about what it means to be Israel. So he just right. keeps giving you example after example of a new relationship that can be created through Christ. Right. And that relationship is not through the law of Moses is what it seems to me he's trying right. to say. Right. Because because it's dead. Yeah, that's right? exactly right. And, and and not just that the law is dead. You died in relation to the law. 
you're yes. a new creature. Right. Right. Perfect. Okay. Sorry. Keep going. No, you're, you're so, so therefore we, we who have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, again, it, it's just, it's to me kind of beautiful imagery and it, it cause he's mixing metaphors, but mm-hmm. the body of Christ was represented in baptism who died. Mm-hmm. We are now dead to the law through the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. Right. That you should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead. Okay. Now he goes on to point out about now that we've been changed, we've been delivered. We we have the spirit now that can testify to these things. But that doesn't mean we aren't going to make mistakes or make errors, right? In fact, right. he's going to talk about how the his body. Now he's going to t- switch to a physical body. My body, I I want to do good, but I'm yet carnal, right? Verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, soul to understand. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that do I, right? In right. other words, I've been changed. I know better. I have a I have a greater desire to, to be better. But man, I keep making mistakes. Yeah. I keep sinning. I keep doing this. And he's like, and I don't, it's frustrating. It's yeah. very frustrating. I think in a way he's described something that everybody has gone through. Everyone yeah. has said, okay, I've actually, I don't want to do that anymore. And then in a weak moment, okay, I want to do what I did. Oh, but wait, I knew I didn't want to do that. Why did I do it? Right. I think that's what he's described. And I don't know anyone who hasn't been through that. No. And I think, I think part of the message might've been, I, I don't know how many people thought this in the ancient world, but the idea that well, once I got baptized or once I made that commitment or once I once I proclaimed Christ as my savior, I'm done. And it's like, no, 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 no. The, the power the power of God is the salvation, right? So the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God into salvation. We don't ever get past a point where we don't need it. Right. Right? So even though the old man of sin, the law, has died and we have now committed ourselves to being a new creature— we still need it. We still need Christ. We we still need the Spirit. We this this transformation that we're undertaking and are going through isn't complete just because we made one good choice, right? Even if we even if that choice was to partake of an ordinance that is necessary for salvation, that doesn't mean we're done. And again, Christ taught that right that that baptism just isn't enough to get you to where you need to be and and to become what you want to be. It's a it's a process. And so I look at chapter seven in terms of the overall thesis of going, yeah, but once you get baptized, you're still not done, right? Now we got to figure out how to get that. I know what I want to be. I know what I can be and get it aligned with what I'm actually doing because we all fall short. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Right? So verse 22, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And and now, see, to me, this inward man is, inc- this is another way from to tie back to material that he's mentioned before. Remember what it was to be a Jew, right? Yeah. It was the inward. So now we have an inward man that he's talking about. There's so many places where he keeps tying this back to this, to stuff that he's already established. And that's just good essay writing, right? That's good research. Yeah. And I, and I think he's got an oblique reference almost throughout to the Jeremiah and, and secondarily Ezekiel reference that. It, God will establish a new covenant and then the law will be written in their hearts or as Ezekiel in the inward parts, yep. you know, this, this idea, if for those who are familiar with that, they're going to catch on to, oh yes. Okay. This is was prophesied of by Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And so the inward and the, in the heart and the law in the heart keeps drawing on old Testament references that should help his Jewish audience understand this isn't Paul making this up. This is actually drawing images on what we know is true. So. And I would add to that, it's it's uh, it's not only hearkening back to those prophets, but is teaching again what it means to be Israel. Yes. Right. Yeah, because that's what those prophets were trying to teach. That's exactly right. What made you back then? They, it wasn't Jewish. It's what made you Israel. It's written in your heart. Right. He's established that what makes you Jew is what's in your heart. Now he's talking about what is it that what is it uh, if you're a Christian, what makes you Israel? It's what's in your heart. Yeah. Right. It's Good. it's we, we tend to and I know that you've talked about this. I know that you've written about this. Right. But what makes us Israel that that Israel moniker isn't a sub category of self. Right. It is 
it's one of the primary ones. Yes. Right? Jew, Gentile is below Israel. Both Jew and Gentile can be Israel from Paul's right. perspective. Right? So if we're looking at the Old Testament, and if, he, and if he's alluding to these things, and I think you're right, he's new, this law written in your heart, these tablets of the heart, or this inward man, this is stuff that would harken back to these prophets who defined what it means to be Israel, and they kept defining it to your covenant relationship with God. Yeah. And they were doing the same thing. They were saying, yeah, we're not, we're blowing it right now, but right. God's going to get us to not blow it at some point. That's exactly right. Yeah. Right. So, so anyway, I, I think that's set up. And now, so now he introduces a new law to us in verse 23 of chapter seven, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the, the, the body of this death? Right. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. In other words, we're not done. And back to this idea. Even though you've been baptized, it doesn't take everything away from you. Even though you've chosen to follow Christ, it doesn't mean that you're not going to fall sometimes, right? That, that um, and, and I've said this in another context elsewhere, that just because you fail doesn't mean you're a failure, uh, right? Right. And so, but what he is trying to show is it doesn't matter. We are constantly in need of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the good news because it's the salvation for all. And now we can add not just for all, but every time, every when, everywhere, right? Yes. Even when you're Christian, you still need it. Yeah. Even the reborn me keeps falling prey to the carnal me. Right. And so I still keep needing Christ is I right. think what he's saying there at the end. Right. We're, we're still up against another law. And instead of it being the law of Moses, now it's the law of the carnal man. Right. And, and I should say with carnal, the carnal man, he might not define carnality here necessarily, he just talks about the warring of, of, in the members. And sometimes we take that in a, in a very physical sense, right? The car, special carnality, we tend to think of it in terms of sexuality. But in 1 Corinthians, and I know we're not in 1 Corinthians, but I'm just going to read this because he defines carnal nature. Here's what he says. Uh, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas is there among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal? Right? Yeah. I, uh, I think for Paul, the carnal is the same as what we might call natural, the, the natural mm -hmm. man, the not yep. godly man. Yep. That's exactly right. It's, the it's fallen. The, fallen is another phrase. It's fallen. It's, it's, it's not just lust and it's not just physical desire. It's are you envying? Do you have strife? Do you, do you constantly look to be offended? I mean, First Corinthians is rife with this, right? This letter that he writes to the people of Corinth, they just have problem after problem after problem. And it has to do with divisions and taking offense and being envious and angry at others. That for him is the ultimate sign of a carnal man, right? And, and that's the law that wars within our members to, to use language that he's giving in verse 23. That is just that constant need to compare ourselves to others is is carnal. Yeah, very good. Uh, I All would right. agree. So that takes us to finally to chapter eight, right? So in chapter eight, now he points out that the, the law of the spirit, uh, verse two, for instance, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from law of sin and death. So he's recapping. Jesus Christ has made it so that we can overcome these things. But that, again, doesn't necessarily mean that we've gone through a full transformation. And that that picks up for me down in verse 14, right? Now, these get to become very uh, – the next uh, 10 verses or so, eight verses or so, are some of the more beautiful passages of Scripture, I think, that defines our relationship with God and, and what we need to do, right? Which is what it's all about. So, yeah, yep. let's jump in there. So, here we go. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God – they are the sons of God, sons and daughters of God. Yeah, I, I would say children of God is a very fine way of translating this. Yep. In fact, that's the way he's going to describe it in verse 16. And and this is a theme that we've seen a number of places in Scripture. Like that's almost a John chapter 1 theme. Mm -hmm. right? it's, so it's not just Paul. Who knows? Maybe Paul's getting this from John when he met him or right. whatever. But this is uh, a, a prevalent theme that as if you 
turn to the light, is how John will say it. You turn to God rather than the world. Then you become part of the children of God, which goes back to this, you're born of Christ business that Paul's been talking about all along. So sorry, keep going. No, you're you're exactly right, right? So this this transformation, this is, if we're moving through our steps, notice we've been baptized, we've been reborn. Now we're, we were married to Christ, right? A new creature. Now we're becoming sons and daughters. And yet he takes it to the full extent of what true salvation is. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The spirit, verse 16, I mean, we'll come back to look at verse 15 in a second, but verse 16, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, right? Mm -hmm. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And that right there is the salvation of man, yes. right? If we're going back to our thesis, he's now finally gotten to what salvation really is. This is salvation. Yep. That, you, that you could be an heir of God and joint heir with Christ is incredible. Yeah. And, and a joint heir with Christ says so much because, and, and this is what we believe, but will drive so many of our, our Christian cousins uh, nuts. I mean, if you're a joint heir with Christ, it means you're equal with Christ. Mm -hmm. um, you've become like he is and you receive like he is. And that's exactly what we believe. Yeah. No, I is he's going to talk about this again in Ephesians when he talks about Jesus Christ as the first one that God could trust, right? And yet we also trust in Jesus Christ. It's and and, and an idea that shows up later in Hebrews to the writer there in which he says that there's no difference between those who um sanctify and those who are being sanctified in God's eyes, in Christ's eyes. He he's not ashamed to call us brethren. Uh, there's something very profound to that and and is an is an underlying theme maybe not common throughout the new testament but enough there that you know that this is a teaching that they have right yeah as to the children so there's a couple of things here notice that he talks about in verse 15 for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but you've received the spirit of adoption um one of the things that I really like about verse 14, 16, 17 is the, is this seems to reflect that ancient or Eastern understanding of what it means to be a son or a daughter, right? We sometimes see these terms of son and daughter and children, maybe even from um, um, the word would be ontological, but the idea that, that, that we're offspring of God, that we're the mm -hmm. offspring of God. Right. But it's more than that. It's more than that. Because if we think of it just that way, we run the risk of falling into a similar type of trap that the Jews did, which was because we're the literal offspring of Abraham, we get the promises. Yeah. And, right? and there's really no difference between me and anyone else and so on and so on. No. Which in a way is true and in a way is not, right? Right. And so, but but from an ancient Near Eastern perspective, these terms son and daughter – right? We have plenty of records, particularly in Neo-Syrian, just because that collection is huge, of adoption documents, where you'll find an individual say, I recognize this particular individual is my offspring, but I'm choosing this person to be my son, right? right? Where the term son is separate from offspring. They're not the same. Now, if your offspring, could you be a son? Yes. But does it guarantee that you're going to be the son? No, right? Sonship and daughtership in the ancient Near Eastern perspective is conditional. It is not an unconditional state. You can be the offspring, but that doesn't mean you're the son or daughter. And the now truth this, is- Oh, go ahead. Oh, go for it. No, no, no. I'll, I'll be slightly tangential, so keep going. Okay. This, this holds true, I think, with most of these. We tend to think of father and mother as terms that refer to uh, the the- physical relationship between offspring and parents, right? right? But I'm not convinced that's the case either. In Abraham chapter one, you find that he wants the blessings of the fathers and the right to administer the same, right? Suggesting there that if he gets those blessings, he becomes a father, which means it's the blessings that make him a father, not having offspring per se, right? The right to administer them. Or in Abraham too, where you find that the children of Abraham those who would rise up and call him son and or father are those who accept the gospel. That's a that has nothing to do with offspring. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so we have these terms that really reflect to a covenant relationship we have with individuals, which may or may not have anything to do with us being literal offspring of anybody. Right. Very good. Right. Very good. And, and uh, so along those lines, I think this gets to be tricky ground. Um, I uh, fully understand the use of the term adoption here and uh, and the context you're giving everything else I, I agree with. And I'm also aware that for many people, this is a very sensitive issue, uh, in, including, and if you would rather, we can cut this up, but including, that I know that you're uh, adopted, although mm -hmm. I, I, I've seen you have a, a closer relationship with your mother than most people do. Um, and And so... Uh, I think that this phrase adopted is important, but I think sometimes it negates in our mind the reality of being born by Christ. The reality mm -hmm. of the fact that when you are changed, when you are a new being, that really was a being created by Christ. And uh, and when we think of, when we don't think of it that way, I think sometimes we downplay the importance of becoming a, a new creature. Uh, and and so. Uh, I think we are adopted and are not adopted at the same time, right? If, if you see what I'm saying, like uh, I, I just don't want to minimize the I, the notion that Christ has become the the literal parent of the new person that I am because he created the me that I am now and hopefully the me that I am in the future because I wasn't capable of creating that me myself and neither were my parents capable of creating that me themselves. So we have someone else that steps in and does it. And so I think that, that we want to make sure, I mean, the, the kinds of beings we are, there's so many facets to it. We have to use a hundred different metaphors to understand what it is. And I think that you've done a fantastic job of uh, uh, explaining the metaphor that Paul is using here. Uh, and yet I think that it only partially answers to the metaphor he was using earlier right so you, you have uh, all sorts of stuff that paul's trying to do uh, and we just have to kind of try and muddle our way through it sure and, and and i get that i the 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 one thing i would say to that is is um what paul seems to be addressing here is, is while you may have been changed by christ that mm -hmm. does not guarantee anything right Right. Right. So so if you if you look down in verse 17, this is where what it means to be son and daughter in that conditional element. So you and I might have been we were baptized. We got changed. But that mm -hmm. doesn't guarantee any. Right. Right. That doesn't guarantee an inheritance. Right. Right. I and, agree. And to that point, that's where I think verse 14 is really helpful for as many as are led by the spirit of God are the sons and daughters of God. Right. Right. You can have the spirit. But, but if we're not following it and we're not being led by it, if we don't actively seek for it, you might have been baptized and you might have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, but that doesn't mean you're using the gift of the Holy Ghost. That doesn't mean That's you're right. right. So you still can be changed. I believe that to your point. But if you aren't doing something about it, then it he's not going to guarantee you exaltation. Right. Well, and that change isn't necessarily permanent right we if right. we go back to, to to turning away from christ and following the world then that change is undone and and then christ is no longer the father of that that new well, you because there is no new you and isn't that what president nelson meant when he said you have to nourish your testimony you yes. have to nourish it you can lose it you can lose this yes right That's alma exactly talks right. about it in the sense of if your if your heart is soft you increase in knowledge but if it hardens, you lose the knowledge even when it is given to you, which I always find a crazy, a crazy yeah. paradox. But and yet I've seen it happen. Yeah, yeah, right. You can still go and get all of these things, but you will lose the knowledge that you had even as new knowledge is given to you, which is crazy. Yeah. Yep. And I, as you're talking about Alma, I think he also sums it up when he says, you've, if you felt to sing the song of redeeming love, or in other words, if you've been mm -hmm. changed, can you feel so now? Are you still changed? Right. Are, are yeah. you still coming to Christ so that He can continue to change you? Change is a continual process. Do, do you anyway. see with that? Do you see with that eye of faith? Can you see? Yeah. I mean, what are you doing? Because if you think this is, you think everything got fixed the minute you made that choice? No, no, no. You're just a new creature, right? Yeah. Paul will say yeah. the same thing to the people of Corinth. He's like, "I came and fed you milk. You are yet unable to handle me." That's not a good thing. Yeah. 
So, and anyway, so to all of those points, what he's pointing out is, is Christ made it possible for you and I to become sons and daughters of God. And if that's true, then we can become heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. That's our salvation. And But then he does something that I find, it's about the only place where this gets mentioned, but it's a brief glimpse into an understanding of Paul's. And then and, and honestly, this is the this is one of the few places in this book where I think he just takes a small tangent for just a second hmm. and then comes back to it. In that he demonstrates what I call the cosmic scope of the atonement of Jesus Christ. If the thesis was that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of salvation unto all, for this one moment, when he says, this is for one place where he's like, by all, let me expand what I mean by all. Because if you look down at verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God, i.e. there's something that's waiting for you and I to become exalted beings or the exaltation of God's children, those who now are his children. By the way, and that concept of children, that's that's the parable of the prodigal son, a son who loses the rights to inheritance but gets it back. Or when Mormon writes about charity, this is you needed so that you might become the sons and daughters of God, right? So in this case, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for this, for you and I to be, receive our full inheritance. Now, the footnote there for creature is the Greek word. It, well, it's the translation of the Greek word, right? But the footnote there for creature under verse 19 is all matter. It's the cosmos. It's all matter in the universe. What? Wow. So, yeah. Right? And then he defines, and, and then we have earnest expectation, which can mean that there's a hope. There's a, The universe has a hope. Now, I know we're personifying the universe, and, and and that gets tricky, but what he's pointing out here is there's some implications to the atonement of Jesus Christ. There's there's some implications to what Christ did. If you and I can be transformed and receive a full inheritance of God, which is exaltation, there's some huge implications to that. So he goes on, for the creature, which now we can say is all the material universe, was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who is subjected the same to hope. Now I'm now I need to preface what I'm about to say in saying I'm not saying that Paul is a physicist or knows the law the, the laws of nature. But they do know about entropy, right? They see it. They might not have a word for that the way we think of it, and they might not think of it in terms of cosmic scopes of heat and everything else, but but they do know it. They know that a thing can be in a great complex state. And that over time, that system will break down into simpler and simpler states until it is no longer a thing. They see that in a body that dies. Right. 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 And in all sorts of things. And it's possible that Paul's seen this in some type of vision. For the creature was made subject to vanity. Vanity here means emptiness, nothing. Right. From Mm -hmm. a modern physics standpoint, right now, there's a huge debate as to what's going to happen to this universe. Right. The material of this universe. And the consensus right now is that if left unchecked and we don't have any reason thinking otherwise, it will end up in a state called heat death, right? Now, heat death is the ultimate state of entropy in that there's no light, there's no movement, there's no heat. Because while you st- you didn't lose energy, it's no longer kinetic energy. You can't use it. Hmm. It's all potential. So, th- And there's nothing to spark it. And therefore, this can lead to a very nihilistic, perspective on things, right? right? What's the point if it's all just going to break down and die in the end? Everything, everything, not just my body, this earth, this sun, this solar system, this galaxy, this whole thing collapses into heat death. The creature was made subject to that. But the creature itself, verse 21, also should be delivered from the bondage of corruption. And that bondage of corruption to me is entropy, death. This is the way it's been defined by Paul elsewhere. It's the way it's defined in the Book of Mormon by Alma. Corruption here doesn't mean wickedness per se, but it means anything that decays. He'll he'll use it that way a number of times in this epistle, uh, talking about death as corruption and incorruption being resurrection. Yep, that's exactly right. It just simply means that which is imperfect and decays, and that's entropy. 
right? Mm -hmm. And by virtue of talking about the material universe, I'm really using the word entropy here. This is across the board. This isn't just yours in my sinful state. We're, we are egocentric creatures, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. And we tend to look at the atonement of Christ egocentrically, right? I need it to help me, which I get. Hmm. But every moment, every now and then, there's a brief glimpse to a cosmic scale to this. And this is Paul's, right? I'm, I every time I read this, I'm stunned by the comprehensive total effect the atonement of Christ has on everything. When we read Doctrine and Covenants 88, and we read that he's in all things and through all things, and he comprehendeth all things, because he's gone below all things, right? That he that this light fills the immensity of space, that's a glimpse of a cosmic Christ. This is one here. And this is one where it's your salvation is proof to the universe that it too will experience that same deliverance. Or to put it another way for me, these verses suggest that the second law of thermodynamics is just not in effect anymore. It is for you and I now in time and space. Yeah, yeah but God will overcome it. I mean if you end up with a if you end up with a resurrected being, if there's such thing as a resurrected being, the second law of thermodynamics is no longer in effect. Yep. And that's the atonement, that's gotta be true. That and that's the atonement of Christ. And so, yeah. now Paul's going to get right back into his thesis, but for just these brief verses. Yeah. Right. I just find it. I just find it beautiful. Yep. It's good stuff. All right. Well, okay. So having done all of this, notice that he even ties it back to this, uh, a little bit of this cosmic Christ at the end of it. For I'm persuaded, verse 38 and 39, I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in our Lord Jesus. Right? It's just, you can't overcome this. You can't break this. His his relationship with us now is, is to your point that you said earlier, there is no great way to describe. We don't We don't have it. We don't have a great way to do it. Isaiah, I think, ran into the same problem when in, uh, what is it, Isaiah Isaiah 49, when he says, can a woman forget her sucking child, right? You know right. that verse? Yeah, oh, yeah. It's a rhetorical one. Yeah. Yay, she may forget, yet I will not forget Unlikely, you. but she could. Yeah. Right? He went to, talking about the concept of a redeemer, went to one of, if not the, closest so so that that imagery there isaiah seems to take the since he's talking about what it means to be a redeemer or how god is our redeemer christ is our redeemer he's now taken it to the perhaps closest if not the closest type of human relationship one can have a mother that actually nurses a child yeah. right mm-hmm. and since that, the verb is, is the closest probably yeah it's it's an imperfect verb, which suggests even that it could be ongoing. So yeah. the imagery could be of of a mother who is actually in the moment nursing her child, right? right? So the child is attached to her, and the question is, can she forget that? And yet the rhetorical answer is, yeah, she may forget, but I cannot forget you, suggesting that that relationship between us and Christ is even closer than mother to child, and we don't have any better. We, we don't have anything closer. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's the best um, it, ha- it is. That, that's the best we can come up with. And so to what you said, it's these, the incomprehensibility of Christ's love for us or what it's not. It's, we keep coming up with these metaphors. Paul keeps trying metaphor after metaphor after metaphor, and none of them really fully grasp this. Yeah. Right. In Ephesians, he's going to talk about the incomprehensibility of God's love, which paradoxically you can comprehend, but not through any normal means. Anyway, so chapter nine, finally, we get here to his definition of what it means to be Israel, or at least where he discusses this. Right. So now that we've established that we can become sons and daughters of God, that our salvation, this is what it can be. Now we get to the question of, so what does it mean to be Israel? He's defined what it means to be a Jew. He's defined what it means to become a son and daughter of God. Now we can get to this question of what does it mean to be Israel? 
And we can see that down here in verse six, where he says, now, as though the word of God hath not taken none, hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, right? Which is right. what you actually said earlier in this podcast. Right. Yeah. And neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. Again, just because you're the descendant means nothing in this Israel thing. Which goes back to exactly what we were talking about earlier. You 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 might have those genes, but you're not necessarily actually the heir. It doesn't prove anything. It did, yeah. it doesn't guarantee. That's really what we're coming to is, yeah. is guarantees, right? It doesn't guarantee you anything. Some of this, what he's been talking about, the law is the law of Moses doesn't have enough to guarantee you salvation. Therefore, it can only bring death. Right. right. Being right. being of the lineage doesn't guarantee you anything. Having the law doesn't guarantee you anything. But Christ does. Christ guarantees things. Christ allows for real change, real transformation. Sure. So neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall they seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, which he's just defined in the last chapter as those who are led by the Spirit and therefore can receive an inheritance. Good. These are not the these, uh, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed, right? Yeah. So now you've just allowed for the fact that a Gentile can be Israel. This defines Israel in the same way what a Jew was was defined back in chapter two, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it is someone who actually keeps the promise, but right, that's exactly right. And really, that's what the rest of the chapter goes on to explain, right? That you even if you're if you're a Jew, if you're a Jew descended from Abraham, you can't really say what it, Israel is. That's God's call. It's always been God's call. It always will be God's call. You don't get to choose that. Right. And if he could make you a child, then he certainly can make a Gentile child. Good. Right. Good. Yeah. So, and he has so many different ways and so many different metaphors and so many different scriptural examples he's going to use to try and say that. Right. Whether he's talking about Pharaoh or a power of a potter over clay or whatever else. Uh, he's just all different ways of trying to say the same thing. That's exactly right. And you can even see it in verse 31. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, have not attained the law of righteousness. Wherefore, why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. Right. And, and right. he says that's why it's the stumbling stone because yeah. – and remember that Christ uh, – and he's, and he's been hearkening back to Isaiah just before that, and, and really Christ is going to be the stumbling stone. But it's because they're looking for the law, not for what Christ really is and what he really does. And and I have to say I think we run a little bit of a risk of this even uh, in uh, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We have so many things we're trying to do. And good for us for trying to do so many good things, whether that be uh, ministering as we should be doing because we love people and, and uh, you know, our emergency preparedness and whatever else that we're trying to do. Um, but sometimes we can get so caught up in that that we forget that there is no amount that we can do that will be enough. It, it's not enough if we're talking about saving ourselves. What in the end is important is that Christ is going to save us. And so then whatever we're doing, if we're really trying, if it's with our heart, is enough, right? And that's the that's the ironic uh, twist there is that nothing we could do can be enough, but with Christ, anything is enough as long as our heart is in it. And so we need to kind of quit focusing on, am I doing enough and beating ourselves up because we're not doing enough and focus on, am I loving God? Am I loving my neighbor? And then the stuff we do will just flow naturally from there, and it will be enough. God and, makes it and, enough. And with that, you just summed up chapter 10. Well done. Oh, well, right. there you go. No, but I mean, that's his point. That's exactly his point. He goes through the exact same stuff. Salvation comes through righteousness to those that believe in Christ, right? You, you need to put your faith in Christ. You need, to, you need to come unto him. You need to develop that relationship. He'll help you determine what you need to do, right? If, if you're going by just what? And, and I hate to phrase it like this. If you just go by what the handbook says, that's not enough, right? To this, for the news, to the strength of youth pamphlet, there, there's a reason why it is less prescriptive, marking, prescriptive, yeah. right? Now that doesn't mean they don't want you to engage in good behavior. That's that's or avoid the, bad behavior, <laughs> right? It, yeah. it, some have gone well. It doesn't say that anymore, and I want to go. That's as Pharisaic as the checklist was. 
Yep. Right. That's you exactly just re- right. You've just reversed the checklist. Oh, if it's if it's not there, then it must be. And I want to go. That's not. That's not how that works either. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, it's the same problem. But to this point, it's it's your faith in Jesus Christ that's going to get you your salvation. It's going to. That's what's going to bring about that. That's the good news. Is to Jesus Christ coming unto Him is what brings about that salvation. And so that's chapter 10. That really is chapter 10. Verse 12, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, right? Now, I should point out, he said this exact same thing back in chapter two, dealing with judgment on the negative end. If it weren't for Christ, we're all judged and we all fall short. And there is no difference. Now, though, there is no difference when it comes to salvation, Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter. There is no difference. He's 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 taken that and just gone, there's no difference either way. Right. We were right. all going to be judged negatively because there was no way to overcome the natural man. And now, thanks to Christ, we can all receive exaltation and salvation. There, there's no difference. Yep. It's really kind of cool how he keeps coming back to stuff that he said earlier. Yeah. And I mean, like verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? It, it, free right. to all. Yeah, that's, that's exactly, exactly right. right. It's the thesis. It's our thesis. And we saw both sides of the thesis. We all need the salvation. We all fall short. Now we all get the blessing. We can all have it. Yeah. It's really a great thesis. All right. So yeah. finally, chapter 12. So if all of this seems to come across as, as slightly not anti-Jewish, but Jewish, Jewish critical, has yeah. God cast away his people? No. No, for I say that as an Israelite of the seed of Abraham and of the tribe of Benjamin, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew, right? Mm -hmm. There's some promises that are coming. Again, and this is where I'm really left with this, even though the thesis seems to be responding to the question, do you need to become Jewish? The larger question is, what does it mean to be Israel for early Christianity? And and this is where we still have promises for Israel. Right to those that are descended, what has he has he gone away from that? No, right. Verse five. Even so, then at this present time, also there's a remnant according to the election of grace. Wait, which chapter in? Sorry, chapter eleven, verse five. Okay, eleven. Even so, at this time, also there's a remnant. Right. You still, we still have Israel out there, a, a, a group that are descended from Israel. Now he's going to end up describing them later as uh, they. There's a promise the Gentiles have this, but Israel's still out there. They still need to come unto him eventually. So, what he does he tell the Gentiles? I think you can see it down here in verse sixteen. If the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. Now, to a Latter Day Saint, the next set of verses should look very familiar. This appears to be. Uh, at least it's the same material from the allegory of the olive tree. Yeah. Right. Um, focusing on a particular part, which is if God cuts off the natural branches of the tree, which is what he did, he's going to have no problem doing that to the grafted branches if they don't produce good fruit either. Right. Mm-hmm. And nor does that necessarily mean that he's forgotten about those branches that he cut off. Right. right? So, right. so if you were a Gentile in Rome, while this has made you feel good, uh, I can be Israel, that doesn't mean that you cut off the lineage Israel. You can't forget that either, right? You don't need to be circumcised. You don't need to become a Jew. But the promises are made to Israel, right? And and to the Book of Mormon that teaches this too, just because you're Israel doesn't guarantee that you're Israel. But you right. do have a group of people that have covenants, and by virtue of that may come around eventually. You can't cut them off. So to something that you said way back at the beginning of this, right? If you've got these new Jewish converts that are back in Rome, right. you can't cut them off. You cannot do that, right? You might know better. And this is something This is something Paul will actually say a couple of chapters a, a little bit as he gives some practical advice now, what to do if you're a Christian. If you know better, Right. It's going to go to eating of meat. Clearly, I think some of the Jewish converts are going to react to the eating of maybe meat, maybe pork or whatever it is. Yeah. Right. He's going to say, as a Gentile, you might know better than this. As a, as a Christian, you might know better than this. But good heavens, if you know that it offends, why? Why would you do it? Yeah. Why would you do it deliberately to offend someone that's weaker? 
And offend in this case, because he's used it in the last chapter, the, the word offend means to trip. It means to stumble, to cause to fall. Why would you create division that trips people up deliberately when you know better? Right? Good. And so, so we'll get to the practical in just a second, but, but this is what he has in chapter 11. This is his warning to the Gentiles. Just because he got, you got grafted into the tree doesn't guarantee that God's going to leave you there forever. If he cut off the natural branches, he's not going to have a problem doing it to the grafted in branches either. Right? So mm-hmm. this isn't where you as a Gentile get to go, oh, well, yeah, these, these warnings, these admonitions, they're not for me. How could they be for me? I mean, that's right. Right. No. And, and, and it's, uh, it's both, I think, a warning to not just think you're fine and a warning to not be isolationist, but to integrate and bring everyone together. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that's, and that's where we get to really almost the end of this, the, of the, of the, of the essay. If you look at the end of chapter 11, notice that he kind of ends with a, a plea, a prayer, even with an amen mm-hmm. at the end of it, right? Mm-hmm. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, this is verse 32, that he might have mercy. Oh, the depth of the riches of the, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. So we're winding down the essay, and all things are given to Christ. All things are God's. Right. If you're a Jew, you cannot make judgments based on the Gentile convert. If you're a Gentile convert, don't make judgments on the Jewish converts. Right. So 12. And this is where this is where I think the essay really ends with this plea. In light of the thesis, having demonstrated the thesis, having gotten us all the way through this thesis. He now has a request. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be conformed, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you prove what is what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In my mind, now this is Dan Belknap speaking, but what he's done is he's really defined what an Israelite does. And what they do is they sacrifice. Right. This same principle, I think, is going to be taught in Hebrews when he says, why did God call priests in the first place? So that they might offer gifts and sacrifice unto God. And they need to find that further. The question would be, what exactly is sacrifice then? Right. Now, the word, because, again, this is where if the thesis is the salvation to all, what he's also had as a secondary thesis is, what does it mean to be Israel? Who gets to be Israel? And what do you do when you are? This is where I think if you're if you're an Israelite, you offer sacrifice. That's what you do. Yeah. And here he's specific about what that sacrifice should be. Right. And in sacrifice, I've mentioned I mentioned this to my students. The word sacrifice to me is a really fascinating word. We define it as loss. We use it to describe mm-hmm. loss. I sacrificed my time. I sacrificed whatever. Right. And, and by that we mean I gave up something. But the word itself is a Latin word, and it means to change. It The word literally means to make holy. Yeah. That's not a loss. That's a change. That's a transformation. Yeah. In fact, I, I once heard a definition for sacrifice that I liked, and it said uh, a sacrifice is to give up something you like to make it something better. To make it, and that would be the key, is to make it. If you just go by the give up, which is what we often do. So, right. so I've heard it said before. Well, we never truly can sacrifice anything to God because whatever we give up, he just gives back to us better. And and I've always thought that's true if that's what sacrifice meant. It just doesn't mean that. When you look at the animal sacrificed under the law of Moses, they didn't lose the utility of that animal. They didn't no, lose they the animal. It. They ate yeah. it or they changed it. They changed the way it's going to be used. Whereas before yeah. I would have used it for these things. Now I'm going to use it to cleanse sin, right? Right. Well, that's exactly right. So they, they still are eating it, but it, it means something different right. as they eat it. Yeah. Right. If if you pay tithing, tithing, you didn't lose the money. You changed the way you're using it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now you're using it at church. But yeah. Right. You're using yeah. it for whatever. I look at the one where we talk about a sacrifice of time and I go, you didn't lose. You didn't go. If you go minister to someone and you sacrifice that time, 
and you say that, you didn't lose two hours. You didn't blank out and lose two hours off your life. You changed right. the way you use those two hours. Yeah. And and it's an act of agency. I can't make you sacrifice. Right? Mm-hmm. I can force you to give up things, but I can't make you change anything. That's exactly right. And it's you're not sacrificing if it's taken from you. Right. But if it's taken from you and you are willingly giving it at the same time, then it's a sacrifice. Right. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ was a complete and total transformation that made it possible for you and I to transform. Right. He didn't lose anything. He transformed into a being that could provide something for all of us. Good. And that's really captured in verses one and two. Yep. And, and and both the totality of this, because he talks about presenting your bodies, but also not conforming the world, but transformed by renewing your mind. So it's it's a heart and soul kind of a thing, mm-hmm. right? Everything. Uh, and uh, and it, it includes not conforming to the world. That's the yep. that's that's what you're giving up is the worldly things to instead have it, have your will turned into godly things. So it's still your will, but it's no longer desiring worldly, it's desiring godly. And this can tie back to that discussion of the law that he talked about, right? The, there's the law of Christ. There's the law of the body, he says, that we now war against. Well, how do you do it? You change it. You transform it. Yeah. You, you align your natural, you align your body with the mind, with the spirit that changes all things, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I just, th- so if the thesis has been developed, he now gets to the part where he, an exhortation from an apostle, this is what I'd like you to do in light of my thesis. This is what you need to do in Rome. This is the, your problem in, in the congregation is that you've divided into groups as far as I can tell. And Maybe. you divide it up based on well, blah, 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 am I Jewish, am I Gentile, whatever. You didn't yeah. fully grasp that we're all fallen. We all are. It just, it doesn't matter. We all need Christ. And even when we make that choice, we still need Christ. We cannot achieve. Entropy is just such that there's no way we can get away from Christ. We need him. And luckily, he loves us. Yeah. Right? So, Go make yourself a living sacrifice. Go tran- choose to be transformed to become something more than what you are. Christ makes it possible for you and I to become something more. He's put everything in place for us to do that. I, I look at it this way. I go, if we if if we think of it as a if exaltation was a problem to solve, he fixed 99% of the problem. But that 1% requires us to choose it. And yeah. if we don't choose it, no transformation can be made. Right. right. Even, yep. even though, even though we've been changed that birth, that new birth, if we don't decide to follow the spirit, if we don't decide to do these things, if we don't decide to repent, that it's, yeah. he can't make us sacrifice. We have to choose to do that. That's good. And that's, that's the book chapters 12, 13, 14, 15. It all ends up being practical instruction now based on this particular, on this exhortation. Now, what do I want you to do? I want you to be nice to each other. I want you to love yeah. one another. I want you to want you to be sincere with one another. I want you to take care of one another. Yeah. Think, be one body. Think of each other as one rather than as different and so on. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and you can go straight through it and see where Christ taught all of these things straight out of the gospels, whether it is. Uh, whether it is verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, right? Take care of the sick, the needy, afflicted. That's all in chapter 12. Chapter 13, just see it in there. Love one another. Don't, if someone doesn't pay you back right away, don't freak out about it, right? That seems to be in the, a thing. Verse, I mean, just the chapter heading, it sums it up well. Avoid quarreling. Don't make unrighteous decisions. Or, or, or like verse 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Yeah. Love, therefore, or therefore, love is fulfilling of the law, right? Which is what we keep saying. Love God, love each other. That takes care of it. Anyway, it's good. Yeah. And so and so that's all of it. Chapter 15. How will you know? The spirit can be poured out upon you all. And, and there you go. What does he say by the end of it? Now we, now we get to the actual letter part of it. He's like, no, that, guys, that's my message. That's my, that's my essay. I'm hoping to get to Spain. If I get to Spain, I'd love to see you guys on the way there, right? Yeah. yeah. Here's you the letter. You guys are great. And- so on, yeah. Right. Here's the people I'm going to send with the letter. When they get there, receive them, treat them well. Yeah. And that's the end of Romans. Yeah. Well, good. Very good, Dan. I've been inspired uh, 
both to want to be transformed and uh, it, to remind myself how much I need God and uh, how much we all need God together and, and how much we need to set aside our differences and come to God together uh, and have that covenant in our hearts. So thank you for inspiring me, Dan. Well, it's been fun. I, I Like I said, I love this letter. I really do. And I know I didn't do it justice. There's plenty of people that know it a whole lot better than me, but but it well, is we don't have to time see. to do it justice either. <laughs> but no, but it's fun to see how he takes this idea and develops it all the way through, leaving a very beautiful, powerful, uplifting message. We we didn't even get into really the practical advice, but boy, is it worth reading chapters twelve through fifteen. It just has, but but he's going to repeat it. He's going to say the same stuff in First Corinthians, Ephesians. So yeah. it's good stuff. Well, thank you. And we hope it's been helpful for our audience and that uh, if it has been, that they share it with some other folks and uh, that we just go about lifting each other up. So uh, thanks to Dan. Thanks to the audience and everyone who helps make this possible. And we'll see you next week. Thanks for the opportunity.